What's up, y'all? Good morning. How's everybody doing? For those that you don't listen in the morning time, good afternoon, good evening. Um, God has been so good. Let me tell y'all. So God has allowed the podcast to go into India, surprisingly. And I'm super duper excited about that. It's like mad dope. So big shout out to India for listening. Uh, I'm not talking about Indiana. I didn't forget an A. <laughs> I'm literally talking about India, so that's what's up. Um, big shout out. Uh, what's up, y'all? What's up, GWG Nation? Stand up. Ooh, ooh. Um, I love y'all so much, and so let's get into it today. My goal is to do the best I can. All right, I'm going to do the best I can today, all right? So today's lesson, uh, topic, conversation, and let me say this. So, um, man, God has been so good. Let me just Let me just say this very quick. This is the first time that I've recorded so many se- so many episodes in a season. Um, however, your girl needs a break. All right. So listen. So so this week, next week, uh, episode will be the last episode, and then I'll be back uh, in June. All right. So I need y'all to really catch up on everything. Uh, shout out to my birthday. Whoop whoop. My birthday's in June. So listen, I'm letting you know now. After this week, one more week, and then I'm I'm shutting it down for a little bit. I'll be back around my birthday or on my birthday, all right? So my birthday is June 6th, so either the week of the 7th uh, or the week of the 14th is when I'll be back. So start marking that in your calendars. If you haven't been listening, make sure that you listen because I'm only going to say this today, and I'll say it uh, on the next podcast, all right? So let's get into it. So today we're going to be talking about rejection, all right? But specifically, I'm addicted to sin. All right. So I think that this is going to be really good. God has been dealing with me on rejection this week. Um, And so I want to kind of share what the Lord has been sharing with me as it relates to it. All right. So, Father God, we bless you and we adore you. We love you, man, 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 man. This has been such a crazy season. Anybody who's been listening knows that you have been just you've been doing some things, God. And I'm so excited to share the good reports and, and I'm so excited to, to watch it be completed and to, to see it all the way through. I'm determined to see your hand all the way through in my life and in those, uh, individuals who have been listening to the podcast faithfully as they're pushing into you and pushing into faith. Father, I believe in you and I can't wait to hear the great reports. So God, I ask that today as we talk about rejection, that you would be in the midst because a lot of us are struggling with it. A lot of us deal with it. Uh, But I believe that you have uh, a revelatory answer for this time and for this moment. Pray that it affects the people in a positive way that you get the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all. So uh, people who take notes, um, Romans 8. All right. The whole thing, first of all, is bananas. I haven't looked at Romans the way that I did uh, just recently to talk and and to study. Um, And I know some of these kind of seem like sermons, but they're really conversations, um, you know, because uh, it's given insight into how to apply scripture. Right. It's not enough anymore for us as the body of believers to read and not have the, the understanding that we need in order to have the power that we need to overcome things that are happening in our daily lives. So uh, Romans 8 is crazy. If you haven't read it, you really need to read it because it gives us insight into bondage. And specifically, it gives us insight into the law of the flesh. Now, I've talked about this before in a few podcasts previously, but you need to understand, if you're going to understand the difference between spirit and flesh, you have got to read Romans 8. Romans 8 talks about how the law of the flesh in absence of the spirit of God reaps death, reaps death. Okay. So you need to understand that in everything, because of the fall of man, you are in between two different, um, uh, uh, you have, let me say it like this. You have the potential to be in between two different versions of yourself, the sin nature version of you and the spirit man version of you. Okay. That's the dualism, uh, that we now live in. Okay. We no longer are immortal, uh, how it was with Adam and Eve prior to the, to the fall. And we no longer are condemned to death as it was after the fall. We are in between a dualism, uh, or a dualistic, um, a mentality and mindset, but also spirit, um, where, we are no longer, you don't have to stay in sin, but you cannot overcome sin without the spirit of God. All right. So that's what Romans eight is talking about. So, so specifically, I want to kind of pinpoint in on Romans eight, verse two, eight, verse three, second Timothy one chapter one, verse seven, uh, and then Romans five. 
six and eight. Okay. All right. So let's get into it. So, so what's rejection? So there, there are a lot of different definitions uh, for rejection and you guys should know me by now. I, I do my due diligence to kind of look, um, as to what's the, the natural, um, prescription for rejection and, and what is the, the, the spiritual one for, for rejection. And let me just say it like this. The bottom line is rejection is, is absence. OK, if I wanted to sum up what rejection is, it's absent. And for those of you guys who have who have felt rejection, I know I have felt it for a very long time in my life. God is just starting my healing process of overcoming um, rejection. Uh, it is the absence of love. It is the absence of humanity. It is the absence or it is the feeling uh, that starts to oppress you of being undesired, unwanted. Uh, um, um, and it starts to. Uh, affect your soul. And we talk about the soul often, but you need to understand that the soul, uh, if it is crushed, hear me, if your soul is crushed, it makes it impossible for your spirit and, um, um, your, your mind, your heart, it makes it impossible for healing to take place. And when I say impossible, let me rephrase that and say, it makes it extremely difficult. A crushed spirit, or a crushed soul specifically, a crushed soul is extremely difficult to recover from because that now has become the enemy's playground, okay? The way you think and the way you feel is all conditioned in your soul. It is not conditioned in your flesh. Your flesh manifests how your soul is responding to spiritual warfare or spiritual blessings, okay? So what the enemy does is he creates spiritual warfares by creating strongholds, we talked about this in this in our um, in uh, I think it was the the second episode in in this season. He creates strongholds based on your trauma, okay. And I know for a lot of you guys, you're like, "Dag Tosh, you talking about a lot of trauma?" Because I don't think y'all understand what we have gone through, and because we just live life without understanding the power of God, you're ignorant to the devices or to the sin that you're, that you're participating in on a daily basis. It's not really until you start tapping into the presence of God, and it's not until God starts healing you that you realize the layers of dysfunction that you operate in. And so that's what God's been doing with me. There are layers of dysfunction that I call normalcy. (laughs) and they're not normal when I check them up against the things of God they are trauma responses to my life they are trauma responses to situations and what the enemy does is create strongholds in your trauma to perpetuate proverbs or cycles in your head and you rehearse things that happen to you so that you don't get free Okay, so the reason why I'm saying that is because you have to understand that rejection in its purest form in the simplest term is the absence of God. How can you say that, Tasha? Because God is everything. He is love. He is peace. He is hope. He is joy. He is my sustainer. He is my provider. So the absence of him is the the premise for rejection. It is the the pool, P-O-O-L, of emotion that makes you feel abandoned. It makes you feel like nobody loves you. It makes you feel like nobody cares. It makes you feel like nobody's watching you. I felt that way for so long. And if you're not careful, even though rejection is common amongst all of us, sometimes you don't recover. Hear me because I know what my assignment is on today's podcast. Whoever is listening to this podcast, I need you to have faith tonight and today and tomorrow. And whenever you're listening to this, that you will recover. And that is a, 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 it is a, it is a, a a lie from the enemy that says that you are rejected. Now that does not mean that there aren't moments of rejection in your life. Hear me. That does not mean that there aren't moments of people putting a stop sign to you or telling you no, or putting a boundary up or, or, or doing something that hurts you. I'm not saying that at all. Hear me and hear me clearly. I'm not saying that those situations do not happen. But what I am saying is, is that without forgiveness, you grow bitterness. Then that turns into vengeance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You start to create patterns of isolation where you no longer are able to be in fellowship because of your trauma. Y'all sticking with me because of your trauma, because somebody did something to you, you stick in realms that do not quote unquote reject you. 
But the truth of the matter is you should be able to go into any atmosphere that God desires, hear me, you to go into hallelujah, and you should be able to produce God nature or God things, uh, inside of any environment and any sphere of influence. But what the enemy does is he creates one moment of rejection in your life and makes you rehearse it. I'll give you a moment of rejection for me, uh, before we tap in a rejection moment for me is when I was younger, I was dating this person. Person. And, um, um, next thing I know, I caught them on a three-way call talking to somebody else, you know, and, and the individual that they were talking to, you know, they didn't know that I was on the, I was on the other line. Right. Uh, cause this is back in the day. I don't know if y'all know, but some of y'all might be too young who do listen to the podcast, but back in the day we had like, um, um, three-way, but not just three-way. I forget what it was called, but it's like, it was like a chat, uh, on the phone. I forget what it was called, but you could like jump into rooms on the phone and you could talk with people. Somebody going, going to remind me what it's called. Cause I done forgot child. Um, but you could jump into that. So it wasn't just three way you click over, but don't forget we also had dial up. So everybody couldn't be on the phone and doing dial up at the same time. It was, it, it was a lot growing up in the early 1990s and two thousands. It's, it's completely different than 2024. But I said all that to say, you know, the individual thought that they had clicked over and they didn't. And so they on the phone talking about, you know, cause they supposed to be dating me trying to talk to me. They thought they hung up with me and then come to find out they was, they was, you know, setting up a scheme to talk to, 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 to another female, you know, and they was going in. And so I'm on the phone listening for about three minutes. And then I tell them, you know, I'm still on the phone. And it, you know, at a young age, at a young age, I had to be about 14, 13, I learned what cheating was. Okay. Now beforehand, I, I, I kind of understood the concept. Um, but definitely at this point, at this phase, I started to realize, um, what cheating is, what rejection is on that level, as far as relationally. And what made it worse was that person thought it was hilarious. They thought it was hilarious that they got caught. And I'll never forget the way that I felt. And let me tell you something to this day, people are in relationship with me and I'm not just talking about a boyfriend and girlfriend. I'm talking about, but people who know me, I don't like people laughing at me. Now I'm not talking about you laughing with me. You know, if we're looking at saying, I don't even mind you cracking jokes on me, but when I'm in a vulnerable state and you laugh, that does something to me. And for a lot of us, we would assume that that moment, hear me, is normal for us. And I'm allowed to feel that way. But here's what happens when that happens. I may take an innocent situation or I may take a, a naive individual who does not know that that trauma happened to me, regardless of the relationship or situation. And all of a sudden I snap on them. Me snapping on them, hear me, is not appropriate behavior. Hello. <laughs> It doesn't matter. Hear me. What happened to Natasha Daniels at 13, 14 years old as it relates to my perception of what another person is doing to me because I have a spirit of rejection or because I have re uh, 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 um, rejection as a trauma in my life and I haven't learned how to manage it, a.k.a. really not even managing it, really overcoming it. But I'll tell you what. As God is healing me, I'm able to identify it. And now that I'm able to identify it, it's up to me to put things in motion to make sure that I am actively working that space that has been created that makes me feel like I am not good enough. Okay. So that's just a natural example. Okay. But you also have to remember that sometimes the rejection, a trauma moment of rejection, the fear is now in you and everything becomes so real to you. So another example is like, you know, you get these random circumstances that appear and it, it validates that rejection. So an example would be like, you know, you got it, you know, your friends got invited somewhere, but you accidentally got left off the list. Or let's say that your close friend forgot to give you a call back. And now all of a sudden you think that, you know, they don't like you no more. Right. This is how this is how rejection manifests. Right. Or, you know, you're married to your spouse, you know, and they make a remark that you don't like. I've had this happen a thousand times, you know, not realizing what it was. But, you know, they make a remark or whatever. And I completely misinterpret the response. And then, boom, we in a fight and we in an argument. You're at work. You overhear somebody chit chat and, and they turn around and look at you. I had this happen. 
at a job. Y'all got to listen to the previous season so y'all know how I got fired from Chick-fil-A, child. Um, I ain't going to mention no names, but I got fired from Chick-fil-A. But any hoot. And it was because my boss thought I was talking about him, right? Um, and I and I wasn't at all. But anyway, um, anybody who knows me knows I, I don't talk about people. Like, that's not something I do. I talk about myself. Hence, the podcast is about myself. Jesus. Uh, so... Um, you know, you, you, your team members are chit chatting and they're whispering and they happen to look at you or something. And all of a sudden there's a voice that keeps telling you in your head that they're rejecting you or that they're talking about you or that they're this or that they're that. And now all of a sudden you're in this cycle that nobody loves me. You're in this cycle that nobody cares about me. You're in this cycle. And it doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't people hear me or instances that that may be true. But what you don't realize is that you now have associated or you now have grouped everybody into that conclusion. Any small infraction that somebody makes, you've now grouped everybody into that moment. You've grouped everybody into that feeling. You've grouped everybody into that conclusion. And I came to let somebody know today that that's a lie. So let me tell you where this stuff origins from. All right. And I'll do it with, with, with number one, you need to understand that your nature, hear me, your flesh nature is full of sin. Okay. It's going to make sense at the end. I promise you just stick with me. The only way to overcome death of sin is you have to lay down your life and pick up God's spirit. Okay. Your flesh has a law attached to it and it's called death. Whew. You need to read Romans. I'm trying to tell you there is a law attached to your flesh. OK, how do you know that to be true? Because sin is introduced or it introduced death, excuse me, into the human condition. And we find that in Romans five. OK, in Romans five, chapter 12, it tells us how sin is introduced into death. And it says, therefore, just as though or just as through one person, sin entered the world and through sin, death and thus death came to us all. In other words, from here on out, hear me and hear me clearly from here on out because of Adam's sin, individuals, spirit, your body, your flesh, as long as you are in this world, your nature is sinful. Oof. I need to tell you this because I'm getting ready to help you. Your nature is sinful. You may have intrinsic behavior, meaning there's something in you that wants to do good. Here's what Paul was talking about. There are things that I want to do in inside of me that I want to do good, but my flesh does not cooperate. And let me tell you something. When you read God's word, you will learn that the flesh cannot be ruled. Hear me. The flesh itself cannot be ruled without the discipline of God's spirit. Whew. I know, I know I'm saying some real, real good stuff. Cause I know you probably like Tasha. Well, what's your point? My point is, is you have to understand where this introduction of sin came from. The introduction of sin came from Adam and Eve. Okay. The introduction of sin comes from Adam and Eve. And I know for some of you guys who are on here, you're like, Tasha, we know that already, but you didn't hear me clearly. The introduction of sin, hear me, came from Adam and Eve. So when Jesus comes on the cross, Jesus is not getting rid of flesh. Woo! Ah! Ah! He came to die in flesh Woo! in order to accomplish the law that says because sin is is now trapped in your flesh. I require a sacrifice. Jesus came to fulfill that requirement that says you no longer need a sacrifice. I am the sacrifice that is able to give you power to overcome the flesh because the flesh is not leaving. Hear me and hear me clearly. When you get here on this earth, when God creates your spirit and your soul, he gives you a body. And until God does away with the earth, the nature of the realm of the earth is sinful. And because it is sinful, everything that comes from it is sinful. Tasha, that sounds like a contradiction. Because how can every good and perfect thing come from God? Because what comes from him did not come from this earth. 
Hear me, Tasha, that doesn't make sense because in the beginning, God created. Yes, in the beginning, God created, but now everything on the earth is corrupted without the spirit of God. <laughs> without the presence of God here, what Tasha, what does this have to do with rejection? rejection? Because without the spirit of God, you will always feel rejection. I told you already, rejection is the absence of God. Why? Because God is love. God is peace. God is this. God is that. So I can break it down for you in the natural realm and say rejection is not feeling love. Rejection is not being wanted. Rejection is yada, yada, yada. But see, with God, he fills all of those areas. <laughs> so rejection in its purest form at a high level is the absence of God. And in your flesh, there is no God. <laughs> In your flesh, God does not dwell. He does not reign. He does not talk to. He does not talk about. He does not have any type of infraction or any type of dealing with your flesh. He tells you to deal with your flesh. How? By putting it in subjection and by putting it into discipline. <laughs> Jesus. Y'all with me? <laughs> so when Adam and Eve sin, God goes to them. Hear me and hear me clearly because I'm about to debunk this rejection that the enemy is keep placing on your spirit and he keeps placing on your mind. The Bible says Adam and Eve sin. God goes looking for them. I don't know if you heard me, but somebody needs to run right there. <laughs> the enemy wants you to believe that rejection is God's repellent to push you away. But my Bible clearly shows me that when Adam and Eve sin, God went looking for them. <laughs> my God. <laughs> oh, what does that have to do with anything, Tasha? It has everything to do with everything because rejection or sin, even though sin, God does not dwell with sin. God still desires to dwell with you. <laughs> my God, Tasha, how are the two synonymous? The two are synonymous because I've given you now power. Hallelujah. See, you don't need rams no more to talk to me. You don't need oil no more to talk to me. You don't need a veil. You don't need a priest to talk to me. I know that your sin is nasty and I know that your flesh is, is untamable, meaning from the perspective of it's never going to act right, but I've given you power huh, to overcome that. So Tasha, what does that have to do with sin? I'm glad that you asked. And what does that have to do with rejection? Because God still desires to have fellowship with you, even though you are sinful. But what God does do is God said, I invite you in yeah. to have communion with me. Just accept my son. Hallelujah. <laughs> See, because there are always blessings. The Bible says that God reigns on the just as well as the unjust. So God's fair. He extends justice and mercy and goodness because he's an excellent God. He's an amazing living God. So even if you don't believe in him, you still get the benefits of him. Ooh, Jesus. But there is a relational aspect that God requires from his believer or from those who love him. And that is what God is after from you. Point number two, your soul needs to be strengthened if you're going to debunk rejection. You know, I've gone back and forth and there are instances where God rejects somebody. So there's an instance where God rejects Israel. And that is because, let me make that clear, God rejects Israel. Why? Here we go. Because Israel chooses to worship pagan gods rather than him. In other words, they leave him. Hear what I said. It, rejection is the absence of God. Saul is the same way when you read in first Samuel, I think it's chapter 15 or 16 and, and God removes his spirit from Saul or he removes the anointing, that blessing of Saul being King. It wasn't because he was being mean. It was honestly because in Saul's heart, Saul was always going to be stubborn. Hear me toward the things of God. I didn't want Saul. Y'all wanted Saul. So I sent Samuel to go anoint Saul. But the truth of the matter is I already knew, but I needed you all to see <laughs> that he was never fit to be king. Hear me? <laughs> Saul was never fit to be king, but you all needed to see that he was never fit to be king. He will put y'all in a predicament where when I told him to go and kill and annihilate, God was specific, go annihilate, wipe them from the face of the earth, the Amalekites. He said, okay, meaning Saul. King Saul said, okay, and then turned around and bought the king back. Child, I laugh at this story all the time because that's us. You know, God gives us a specific instruction and we try to patty cake our way through it. He bought back sacrifices. He bought back gold and then said, I came to offer it unto you, God. And God said, absolutely not. I didn't ask you for that. 
See, because what we don't know when you do your research and when you do your study about the Amalekites, the Amalekites was a promise made previous to Saul that God promised to the forefathers that said, I will annihilate them. You may not see it in your time, but I will make sure that they become annihilated because of their sin and wickedness against my people, which were Israel. So when Saul came along, it wasn't a matter just of Saul having to do something that God asked him to do. It was if Saul didn't do it, he would now make God's work words seem like a lie. Woo! This is so much deeper, so much deeper. Once you start actually reading your word. So God couldn't let this pass. Not only are you in a position of authority to lead my people, but you're stubborn. See, because you don't know why I asked you to do something and you don't really need to know, but your heart is so stubborn toward the things of me that you're about to make me a lie. And before you ever make me a lie, I sure will remove myself from you. So for those of you that are like, well, God does reject. No, 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 no. Saul rejected God by being disobedient. Whew. Jesus. And I'm not just talking about disobedience to sin. I'm talking about his heart was always going to be disobedient to the things of God. He was always going to look for a loophole for the things of God. So God said, you are in too much of a position that requires authority. I'm looking to save my people and you're putting my people more at risk. So I have to remove you. All right, let's, so let's, let's continue to debunk, right? But then you have instances where I told you in the beginning where it shows us that God is not rejecting us the way that it seems. So then we have another instance and that, that, that instance that we have is with Jesus on the cross. I said all that to say Jesus on the cross. I've never really looked at it this way and I've taught and I've teached, you know, from, um, seven last words and everything else under, under, you know, under the sun. But I need you to know something for those of you guys who are suffering with this rejection, with this loneliness, with this isolation, you need your strength renewed. All right. I needed to first talk about sin in order to show you the pattern. All right. The next thing is you need to understand what's happening to your soul because sin is causing such a ruckus in your spirit and in your life that you can't even hear from God. And you think that God has put you in a place of isolation, but God does not put you in isolation in that capacity. Isolation, absence of fellowship is not God's requirement. Hear me. Whew. God is not asking you to be in isolation so that you can have a, a pity party. If God is placing you in a season or in a moment of isolation, it's so that you spend time with him. How do I know? Ask me how I know. Whoo, jeez. <laughs> Woo, 2024 is wild, y'all. Wow. I ain't got no other choice but to, but to hang with Jesus, okay? But your soul needs to be strengthened. Why am I saying this? Because I never paid attention to it. Jesus was saying, you cannot have my soul. See, you have to understand what was going on on the cross. See, God, his spirit was strong. Jesus' spirit was strong. But now, but him having to now become sin in order to save everyone was causing anguish in his soul. Whoo, my God. <laughs> See, he was fully convinced that I can do the task. Hear me. Jesus was fully convinced that I could do the task. But I'm getting ready to experience something in my soul where every fiber of my being in soul and in spirit, I mean in spirit and in flesh, is getting ready to experience a level of sin that I have never overcome. Let me say it to you this way. Uh, the assumption is that because he was Jesus, that he did not experience sin and or the assumption is that because he's Jesus that he had power to overcome it he disciplined his flesh to have power hear me Jesus came down from off of his throne and he subjected himself to the same process that God allows us to be subjected to when he releases our spirit from the heavenly realm to the earthly realm so he literally laid down all divinity huh, because he was confident that he was going to be able to pick it back up. But hear me, that does not mean that he was absent from temptation. So why are you saying, Tasha, that your soul needs to be strengthened? Because it is one of the few times, if not the only time that we actually see God, his father, not present while he's on the cross. Now, what do you mean by that? What I'm saying by that is it is one of the few times, if not the only time that we see, because in Gethsemane, we can say the same thing. That's why I said few only. The process of Jesus going to the cross is the absence whoo, of his father. Oh my God. 
How do you say that, Tasha? Because God don't like sin. Remember what I said. The law of sin is wrapped in the flesh. And so Jesus had not yet died to give us power to conquer the flesh. So when Jesus and his father are putting this plan together to redeem us back to him in right fellowship with him, he says, listen, I'm not going to do away. I'm not going to do away with the flesh. Hallelujah. But what I am going to do is send my son so that you no longer have to make sacrifice because of the sin that's locked in your flesh. <laughs> and when he dies, he's also going to rise because when he rise, he's going to do what? He's going to take back the power <laughs> of death. See, I came or I was succumb to death in the garden of Eden, Whew. but God gives him a plan to redeem it Whew. so that I'm no longer under the power of death when Christ rises from the dead. So what is your point? God allows his son's flesh to die so that he can rise and the plan of redemption can now be manifested. Whew. Jesus. Tasha, I don't understand. Let me help it to you this way. God desires fellowship. In the garden was fellowship. Sin separates your ability to have fellowship because I'm getting ready to get to the next point and wrap it all together. Because sin separates your fellowship with God, I now feel rejection because he's absent. <laughs> Father, I love you in this place. And because there's no fellowship with God, God said, son, I need you to do me a favor. Hallelujah. I need you to go ahead down there and I need you to uh, 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 act like them. I need you to subject yourself to sinful nature, but I don't need you to sin. <laughs> but I do need you to subject yourself to it. So that way, when you die, hallelujah, you can go and you can get the key of the power of of death so that when you get the key, I can now have fellowship with them as long as they believe in you. Oh my God, because the father believed in him. <laughs> so that's why the requirement now is everybody got to believe in him because Jesus did the impossible. He took his divinity, became humanity, become sovereign. Hallelujah. For a people like you and I, and here's the crazy part, right? Because this is what the enemy does with us, right? He's like, look, God don't want you cause you sin too much. God don't this because you this and because you that. And I laugh because on the cross, Satan was ecstatic about the fact that Jesus was about to die. But what Satan didn't understand, hallelujah, is that, <laughs> is that even though he's going to die, he's only killing the flesh. Ah. Oh. See, now the scriptures are starting to make sense to you when Romans tells you to lay down your life as a living sacrifice because he's asking you to mirror what Christ did so that when you lay down your life, your life now, or you now rise spiritually with Christ, you may be living a natural world or living in a natural realm, but your spirit is now in charge. The override is now your spirit. And it now is your spirit that is communing with God and now has fellowship. Are you with me? I think that you are. Why? Because that gets to my last point, which is rejection makes you addicted to sin. Whew. Let me help you. You cannot fill the void that sin leaves. You cannot. There aren't enough drugs. Ask me how I know there aren't enough. There isn't enough alcohol. There aren't enough parties. There aren't enough men. There aren't enough women. There isn't enough self-sabotaging moments. Ask me how I know I've been through it all. When God removed me from Jersey, it wasn't just closed doors. It was a major feeling of rejection. Everything said no. Every door said no. Every familiar place got tight. It didn't feel good no more. Nothing. My soul was in anguish because no matter what I did, I still felt rejection. I still felt unloved. I still felt unworthy. And let me even break it down to you like this. I started doing things because I believe that if I could win God's graces, he would love me. See, my childhood, my, 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 my life presented traumas in my life that, that literally formed this lie around my heart 
that said, Tasha, you are abandoned. You are unloved. The only measure of love is based on your ability to produce. And for those of you guys who live like that, let me tell you that that's a lie. For so long, I believed that I was only as great as what I could output. And so I spent my entire life up until 2024 outputting because that was the definition of love is what I could do for someone. See, because I didn't know how to receive it. I didn't know what that meant. I started being or dating or I, I, I married, I, I did church, I did everything because I needed to feel loved. I needed to feel like I was val- valuable. I had so many moments of, you know, they call it a spirit of a, a orphan spirit, but it's not just an orphan spirit because that's not in the Bible. The spirit of an orphan is not necessarily in the Bible. What it is, is it's an abandonment. It's a rejection. It's a fear of being alone. Oof. And so then you start becoming addicted to sin. You start becoming addicted to anger. You start becoming addicted to rage. You start becoming addicted to sex. You start becoming addicted to parties. You start becoming addicted to, to work. You start becoming addicted to being a perfectionist. You start becoming addicted to telling people. You start becoming addicted to all of these cycles looking for love because you feel rejected, because you feel abandoned, because you feel like nobody nobody wants you. You even start to, to develop, and I hear this in the spirit, you even start to develop problems. Pride. And when I say pride, I hear this in the spirit. What I mean by that is, no, I'm good. Like, I'm good. I'm good. Can't nobody check me. Like, no, I'm good. Or, you know, I'm straight. I don't need nothing. Let me tell you something. That's one of the biggest things I struggled with is, no, I'm good. I didn't mean to be prideful about it, but I didn't know how to receive. Whew. Jesus. I didn't just not know how to receive, but I didn't know how to receive. I didn't know how to receive romance. I didn't know how to receive love. I didn't know how to receive gifts. I remember that there were times and years where uh, my husband would would try to surprise me. And I'd tell him, no, I don't, I don't want no surprises. Tell me exactly what you've given me. Because I didn't really know what I wanted. The truth of the matter is I didn't know what I wanted. I didn't know who I was. I didn't, I didn't know. I just was used to a level of control out of fear of being abandoned. And so you kind of like delve into different things and you, you play nice here, but you don't hear. And you, you, when I say I became such a perfectionist, the Lord has broken me down to the point where y'all, I don't care. That's why y'all be seeing me on social media. Like, boo, you're not gonna get your hair rebraided. No, (laughs) I'm not saying not to be presentable. Hear me. But what I am saying is anything that would stop me from forward progress. If it wasn't perfect, I didn't move. But God has a way of showing you that I didn't call you to be that because the Bible says that in your weakness, I make you strong. I look for weak moments in my creation so that I can be God. I don't make you weak. Sin does that. Hear me. I ain't forget where I was going y'all. Sin does that. And if you're not careful, isolation, all this isolation talk, God got me in, in isolation. Let me, let me explain something to you. God doesn't have me in isolation, even though I'm isolated. God has me in fellowship. I'm learning how to fellowship with God. And let me, whoo, geez, I feel, whew, I feel you, God. In me learning how to have fellowship with God, I am healing from rejection. Tasha, what are you, what are you, what are you trying to say? My whole identity has been under attack for 35 years. And for a lot of us, one incident has made your entire identity be under attack for 25 years because you need to understand something about rejection. Rejection is rooted in fear. It partners itself with shame and it partners itself with abandonment to create that stronghold in your mind that tells you that you are not loved. Incidences reinforce the fact that you are not loved. But can I tell you something? That is a lie from Satan. And you know why it's a lie from Satan? Because if Satan can keep you in a stronghold of fear and abandonment and shame, you will never accept the fellowship of God. I just told you before, Adam and Eve sin. And then the next verse says that God went looking for them. Uh, God has absolutely no desire 
Paul was in, 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 in Paul, New Testament Paul, Apostle Paul, was tearing Christians up. God went looking for him. The Bible says that David, went, Samuel went to go look for him. There are scripture after scripture after scripture. Well, Tasha, those are good people, but they weren't always good. God goes looking for people. That's why he says, I call you. Will you respond to the things of the Lord? Because he calls you and you have the ability to actually respond. But what the enemy does is the enemy creates opposition or opposing <laughs> characteristics and makes you believe that that's God's will for your life. So fear starts to become what goes in your head. And I never looked at it from this perspective. So father, I thank you. But fear is not because you're afraid of sin. Your sin is making you afraid of God. Oh, oh my gosh. I know you're with me. I don't know who, who is listening to this, but I see your tears. The enemy has got us so wrapped up in rejection that you've created a cycle, not realizing that God has already died and given you power to work your salvation instead the person who's looking at pornography you say to God hey I know I, I can't come to you with this shame the person who's struggling with addiction I can't come to you God with this shame and my question for you is why not you know why because sin has a way of creating such a fear in you that fear starts to give you addictions in your life that you'd rather connect with sin than to face God. But can I tell you something? Natasha Daniels is not perfect. I've done it all. You name it, I've done it all. And you guys can hear about it in some of my other podcasts. And when God brought me to this place, I told you guys in last week's podcast, I didn't want nothing to do with him. I was angry angry and I told you how the Lord arrested my spirit I had you know he had been strategically putting things in my spirit and he arrested me in my living room don't you know that he still arrests me I had an incident last week that almost tore me to shreds almost tore me to shred I had anxiety out of this world didn't even know I had anxiety this week I got a a a uh some disturbing, uh, I know you're like, Tasha, why can't you say? Cause I don't know who be listening to everything. So I can't say it just yet. I promise you guys though. I'll tell you more <laughs> after certain times. I, I promise I'm pretty transparent, you know, but I got some disturbing news. And when I got this disturbing news, uh, I was angry at God. I was frustrated. I was, I was, my initial reaction was to be frustrated because it was another rejection moment. See, you guys have to understand that for the last five months, uh, that's a lie. For the last uh, eight to nine months, not one door is open for me except for two. Moving out of the state of New Jersey and going to school for my master's. They're the only two doors that have opened for me. Everything else has literally been shut down and moved out. Why do I say that to you? Because every time I fill out an application, rejection. Every time I go somewhere, rejection. Every time I don't get a good grade, rejection. Those feelings of rejection start to oppress me. And that's what the enemy wants to do is take the feeling that that absence of being wanted and he wants to oppress you with it. He wants to put that in your spirit so that you're so weighed down and you're so bogged down that you can't move. You don't know where your finances coming from. You get eviction. I got an eviction notice last month. You're trying to figure out where you're going to do. Notice what I said. I got an eviction notice last month, but I thank God I'm still here. Hear me. You, you don't know. Everything is a rejection. Everything is being thrown in your face. You don't know how you're going to pay bills. Bill collectors are called. This is my current life. You don't know how things, rejection after rejection after rejection, you're not qualified. You're overqualified. You don't do this. You make too bit, too much money. You make too little. I don't know how you make too much money on making no money. I don't know how, but when y'all, if somebody's listening to this who works for the States or whatever, y'all help a sister out. Cause I don't understand it. But what the enemy does is he starts to create a fear in you now because rejection has gotten to the point that it's oppressing your spirit, right? It's twofold. So what you do is you self-soothe. I told you guys, God has been taking away my ability to self-soothe. So I can't go drink low key. I'm a party girl. I will party in a heartbeat. 
I also am not around people, so I can't, you know, have somebody to chit chat with or have somebody to talk to. I can't go drink. I can't go party. God is pulling away those things because he says, I want you. I don't want you to put your, your rejection or that feeling into another person, another individual. I want you. And can I tell you all that the best sacrifice that God has been asking me to make comes from Psalms 51. And it also comes from Romans 12. God has been asking for my heart and God has been asking for my body. God has been asking for me to surrender myself to him in a way. Let me tell y'all where I am not always successful. But as I'm healing and I'm realizing that rejection is the enemy's tool to keep God absent from my life, I'm pushing in more and more and more into the things of God. Well, Tasha, I can't really do that because I'm deep in my sin. Can I encourage you? That before God moved me out of New Jersey, I was deep in sin. While I was in New Jersey, I was deep in sin. While I was married, I was deep in sin. While I was single, I was deep in sin. While I was worshiping God, thinking I was worshiping and minister, I was deep in sin. And sometimes, y'all, praise and worship was the only thing saving me from going off the cliff. Sometimes praise and worship was the only thing saving me from going off the deep end. Sometimes doing these podcasts have been the only thing keeping my mind close to him and keeping my spirit regulated. Sometimes God said, I want it. For those who I just masturbated, I want that. God said, I want that. Tasha, you wow, you making it seem like God wants it all. Let me tell you why God wants it all. God wants it all because he believes in you. Whew, Jesus. The same way he believed in his son who had to subject himself to the flesh is the same way he believes in you because if his son could become, take off divinity to become humanity, die and sit on the right hand to atone for you then you have to understand that the power of the spirit of God that can reside on the inside of you it takes discipline but it doesn't mean that you cannot overcome the things of the flesh as long as you stay in fellowship with God King David I crack up all the time at his story the Bible says that to ensure that he was dead they threw a concubine in there because until he died he loved women I'm not saying that that should be your thorn and an excuse, hear me, for you not getting better. But what I am saying is God cares more about your heart. And if you want power to overcome it, God will give you power to overcome it. The anxieties that you feel about being in or being away from God's presence. God is saying, I want you. The text actually proves it in, uh, I think it's in, um, Second Timothy one seven, and it says this, and I'm getting ready to close for God has not given us the spirit of intimacy, uh, of fear, but of power and love and of fellowship. And then in Romans five, it says this, this is what I love Romans five. It says this, and then we're going to close. It says it in verse five. Actually, let's go to verse six. It says this for while we were still weak. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. This is in the word of God. So for those of you that feel like I'm too dirty, no, 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 no. You are ripe, R-I-P-E, for God. Because with a repentant heart, God can work with you. Well, sis, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm ready. You are. The fact that you're even questioning it, you are. You just don't know if you have the power to do it. And I came to let you know that you have the power to do it. Verse 8 says, but God shows his love for us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Can I help somebody? I used to say this all the time in my church. It's about progression, not perfection. Walking the walk with God, God will perfect you. But you have to start somewhere. See, what the enemy does to a lot of us is he creates a spirit of fear. And I took a minute for me to really understand why he does this. Fear is the absence of faith. Oof. Fear is the absence of faith. So the enemy plays in the spirit of fear. That's why it's called a spirit of fear. Because where there is a spirit of fear, you don't believe in God. And the enemy's main job is to create a level of doubt in you. That your isolation will cause a rejection in your spirit and in your soul. 
so that he and his imps can play in your soul and make you feel like the father will never want you. But I came to let somebody know that the father is in love with you, that the father desires you, that the father can take away all of your anxieties. Let me tell you all something. Do not deny the power of discipline. I used to think that if I couldn't get it right the first time, that's the perfection in me. If I couldn't get it right the first time that God doesn't love you. But can I help you? Reread your Bible and you will notice that 95, 98, almost 100 percent of every individual that is highlighted in the Bible grew to the place that you now admire them to be at. They were still sinful. They were still stubborn. They still had issues. They still didn't believe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So do not allow the enemy to disqualify you from the fact that God desires to be with you. God hates fear. And we used to always talk about this and we talk about this, that it's impossible to please God, but I never understood why not just, you know, you got to have faith. You got to have faith. You know why God hates fear. God hates fear. You know why it's impossible to please God be without faith, because without faith, you are operating in fear. There are only two sides to this coin. And if you were to be honest with yourself, you and I can both attest to the fact that when I'm not pushing in faith, I'm operating in fear. That's why there's a spirit of fear and there's the spirit of faith. They are in direct opposition to each other because one, the enemy uses to keep you away from the presence of God and the other one God uses to pull you closer to him. In order to break the power of sin, we find it in Romans three, where it says what the law couldn't do because the flesh was weak. God did it. He sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Hear me as an offering for sin. And then he condemned sin in the flesh. Tasha, what does that mean? It is a fancy way for saying what I've been saying this entire time. Rejection is nothing more than the enemy's mirage that he places to keep you out of fellowship with God. When you understand that your nature is full of sin, you look for ways to say, God, how do I overcome it? Because how did you overcome it? And he tells us that in Romans. And then you realize that the rejection that I feel, Tasha, it puts me in a space where I can't think, I can't breathe. I hear you, woman of God. I hear you, man of God. Your soul needs to be strengthened. Jesus even went through that level of rejection where his father could not look upon him and he had to strengthen himself. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Into your hands, God, I commend my spirit. Father, be with me. He had to strengthen his soul in order to not be in that level of anguish that would not allow him to complete the task. Even though his father couldn't look upon him, he encouraged himself enough that said it is finished. (laughs) And then he went down, got the keys in order to overcome death. And then he ascended. Ascended. Hallelujah. He did some work down here and he did some confirmation down here to let him know I'm getting ready to ascend. He set fire to the earth in a totally different way. The whole earth was shook up. Earthquakes was happening. The lights was going out. It was bananas on here. But he realized that Jesus realized that in his humanity, in order to complete this divine assignment, my soul needs to be strengthened. And last but not least, even though rejection is real, if you are not careful, it will make you addicted to sin. But I came to decree and declare over your life. You don't have to be addicted to sin. And rejection is nothing more than a lie because if God is with you and if God is for you, who can be against you? You don't have to be perfect to get into his presence. All you have to do is be willing. I am a living testimony. I have not wanted nothing to do with God. And I stand here on May 3rd, Friday, May 3rd, to let you all know that now all I want to do is be in the presence of God. Does it mean that I am perfect? Absolutely not. I still have impure thoughts. I still have impure motives. I still have impure realities, but let me tell you something. It pushes me straight back into the presence of God. It makes me desire him even more. It makes me want to do right by him. I found myself the other day just sitting in my bed and I said, God, where are you? I want to find you. I'm looking for you. The other day I was cooking some, some chickpea fritters. Don't ask me why y'all. I just be doing all types of truth. When you don't have a lot of money, you start to become very, very resourceful. Okay. And so I was making chickpeas. I blended up the chickpeas and I had, you know, seasoned them up real nice. Um, (laughs) I know y'all like how you see it with some flour, with some 
uh, with some, uh, 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 some Greek seasonings, some basil, some oregano, you know, with some parsley, uh, some lemon juice, you know, some stuff, blended it up and kind of like put it, made a fritter out of it or whatever. And let me tell you, somebody called, somebody text me and they sent me something and it sent me straight to my knees on my floor in my kitchen. And that was just Wednesday. When I tell you I'm looking for him, I'm looking for him. And so I wanted to leave this with you. For those of you all who are listening to the podcast and for those of you guys who are struggling with that rejection, I came to let you know that you can be free from that spirit. You can be free from that level of oppression. And the only way to be free from it is to find God. And I'm not talking about run to the run to the to the next service. Absolutely not. I'm not talking about pay somebody $50 to give you a response. I'm not saying that at all. Truth, I'm telling you to get in the most uncomfortable, comfortable posture. And you sit there and you cry out to God and you tell him everything. You tell him that you hate your life if that's how you feel. Because let me, let me just tell you what I told him. I told him that I hated my life. I told him that I hate being by myself. I hate that I'm alone right now. I hate that he took everything away from me. I hate that I'm starting over. I, I When I say I was mad, I was mad. I don't know how many more times I got to say sorry. I don't know how many times I got to ask for forgiveness. I don't know how many times I have to forgive and not get an apology. I don't know how I have to walk away from this while I got to be the one. And I had probably said that to him for months. And I finally got in a posture and I let it all go. And I finally told him the truth was I wasn't super duper upset. I was disappointed. I was sad. And I finally got to the place y'all where I said, God, out of all the things that you're allowing to happen in my life, one thing I cannot be without is without you. Jesus, I cannot be without you too. Everything else is gone, but I can't be without you. And so when I was on the floor on Wednesday, I was telling somebody, I said, I don't know where I'm at some days. I don't know whether, and I'm not talking about up, down. I told him I'm in between fear and faith. I still have moments of fear, but I'm pressing into faith. Y'all, I ain't got no other choice. God has taken me to a space in my life where I am totally reliant on him. And you know what that person told me? My good friend D, I'll just give her a shout out. She said, you're going to run right into breakthrough. And then she said this, which is what I say to you all. She said, I'm praying against exhaustion in the area where your faith is being applied. And I don't know who this is for, but I will tell you this much. There will come a point in your life where the desperation Because your willingness is not yet there. Your desperation for the things of God will put you in such a place. Ask me how I know. Where your very words. You will speak like your life is dependent on that cry to God. I am so grateful for what God has done for me up until this point on May 3rd. I've moved from a state of desperation. Because of what I've lost into a space of desperation because I can't be without him y'all I don't want to be without him my brother calls me sometimes and I'll tell him what's going on with me or how things are going because I have my moments and he always tells me he says man I don't know how you do it he said I couldn't do it if I were you he said but you make me not want to give up y'all have no idea how much those things touch me my mother my father the things that are being groomed and that are being grown in ways that I could not have imagined had I let the enemy win and allow rejection to be the ending of my story. God, I'm so thankful that I'm not an orphan. I'm so thankful that my mindset of insecurity and uncertainty is starting to become secure and certain. I'm not an orphan, God, for I am a joint heir with you. 
You have come to redeem me and call us sons and daughters. I am in fellowship with you. I am in right standing with you and nothing can separate me from the love of God. Nothing can separate me from your power. Nothing can set me, separate me from your grace. And for that, I say, thank you. So God, I bless you and I honor you. We collectively bless you and we honor you because we realize father that it is you that it is your fellowship, your desire to have had fellowship with us that debunks this myth that I am rejected. I am not rejected. God, I am loved. As a matter of fact, you are in love with me. You love me beyond any other creation. I am your favorite. I am the apple of your eye. And for that, God, we give you all of the glory. I know I included them, but God, I needed to say it for me myself. And for those of you who are listening, replay this, replay this declaration in your life. You are not alone. You are not abandoned. Tasha, so how do you, let me tell you something. I am physically alone. It is just me. And there are days that I, yes, I battle with feeling like I'm alone, but I'm learning a discipline to run into the presence of God. I'm learning a discipline that I can talk to him about God. I have insomnia today. My anxiety is putting me in a space where I can't think, I can't do my work. I'm locked. I talk to him now. I let him know what's going on. It's not just because it's a default. It's honestly because it's a choice. And God is responding back. And what I can't say with my words for some of y'all who feel that way, you need to write. And don't write in your phone. Don't write in your iPad. And don't write on your laptop. You need to get a pen and paper. There is something special about a pen and paper. And for a lot of us, you know, we don't know how to spell. We don't, know, we, don't know, we don't have good sentence structure. Our hands be hurting. It doesn't matter. Write. Somebody told me one day that I needed to journal and I, I, I abhorred the thought of having to write and use my hand. But when I tell you there's a discipline in writing, God speaks through a written pen. I'm not saying he doesn't speak through type words. But what I am saying is his tongue is attached to a pen and the way that I write is completely different than the way that I type. So I encourage all of you who are listening, find your space with God. God is blessing me in such a way I can't share every single thing, but just know that I promise you that I am not living this life absent of y'all or that I am above where everybody else is at. I feel like we are journeying this thing together. And I encourage you and I admonish you through the fellowship of God and through the fellowship of Holy Spirit, you got this. Y'all call me, y'all reach out to me, y'all Facebook, you guys do that. Even though y'all do that in private, seriously, there's a lot of people who reach out. Yo, whatever you guys need, Trust God first, but just know that I'm here. Build yourself around community. Don't go in isolation. And what you can't say, write it. I promise you that God will meet you. God, I bless you and I honor you. I thank you so much for your spirit. I thank you for dying for us. And just like my good friend told me, I encourage and I decree and I declare. I pray that every person who's listening, that they would run into their breakthrough. And I pray right now that that exhaustion in the area that their faith is being applied would be mute. Father, they would not be exhausted, but that would, they would keep running and they would keep pressing, that we would keep running into you and chasing after you, that we would seek you, that you may be found. I thank you for the seek, God. I thank you because you are great and you are greatly to be praised. We love you and we adore you. Thank you for this lesson. Thank you for this moment, God. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this podcast. I know they sound like sermons, but God, I believe that they're liberating people. I'm watching people be liberated. We're seeing people get liberated. And for that, God, I say thank you. I'm no longer addicted to sin. Rejection makes me addicted to sin, but I'm so thankful that you've given me power and that you've given me the, the invitation to be with you. I love you and I adore you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all. It's late. I love y'all. It's like it's early for some of y'all, late for some of y'all, but I love you guys. Remember, 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 you have the power to overcome it. God has given us each power to do it. I love y'all. And remember, in everything that you do, just make sure that you go with God. Peace.